Good evening. It's an extraordinary pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's book launch. I want to start by acknowledging that I work on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And also to acknowledge that many of you joining us tonight are also working on the land of First Nations peoples and pay respect in that regard. Good evening and a very warm welcome to you all. My name is Pip Nicholson and I'm the Dean of the Melbourne Law School. And it is a particular pleasure to welcome you to the launch of Asia Pacific Trusts Law, the launch of the book and indeed the series. And we'll say a little bit more about that shortly. I am particularly grateful to Justice Susan Glazebrook and Justice Andrew Pang of uh, New Zealand and Singapore, respectively, for agreeing to join us uh, at the launch this evening. And I will leave my colleague Ying uh, to introduce our esteemed judicial contributors later in the program. On a personal note, I did just want to note that in this collaboration, the law school and particularly Ying and Matthew found themselves working with new collaborators and indeed very old friends. And in my case, I welcomed to this project a scholar with whom and practitioner with whom I've been working for nearly 28 years. And it, it really um, pleased me enormously to see Nguyen Hung Kwang involved in the project and a warm welcome to you, Kwang. Asia Pacific Trust Law is a project curated by Ying Liu to provide for the first time a forum for dialogue concerning trusts law across the Asia Pacific. The project involves a biannual symposium or conference and each edition focuses on a specific aspect of the application of trusts and involves discussion of jurisdictions in the region in an inclusive manner. The papers presented at each of these fora are then published as an edited collection in the Asia Pacific Trust Law book series with Heart Publishing, where Ying is the general editor. This work is as important as it is pioneering. We are here today to launch not only the series itself, therefore, but more specifically volume one, Theory and Practice in Context, co-edited by Ying and Professor Matthew Harden. Uh, and this particular collection is based on papers presented at the inaugural symposium at the Melbourne Law School in December 2019. Following my brief comments, Ying will say more about the book and the series in his introductory remarks. But let me say by way of welcome, something briefly about the Asia Pacific Trust Law Project and the way it advances uh, a more general ambition of the law school's aspiration in its engagement with scholars throughout the region. Melbourne Law School, and in particular its academics, sit within a rich array of networks and collaborations across the Asia Pacific. I can mention two centres here, but that would be to diminish the work of many of our other scholars. But for more than 30 years, the school has consistently engaged with scholars, policymakers, and lawyers across the region. Um, and the scholarship and its findings has a potent and very real regional impact. Our work on human rights, Asia Pacific military law, environmental law and labor law, alongside international law, are all areas of sustained engagement with scholars across the region. But the Asia Pacific Trust Law Project adds to those connections in the area of private law, where I think it is fair to say we have arguably had substantially less regional engagement than in public law. And for this reason, the project is welcomed and celebrated. At the same time, the project brings together academics, practicing lawyers, and policymakers. Um, 
in a shared dialogue about the role of trusts, not only in the context of doctrinal developments, but also the role of trusts in their economic, social and political impacts. And this regional dialogue between different branches of the legal community is a hallmark of the project and um, marks it out as distinctive. As Dean of the School, please allow me formally to welcome you to this launch. I hope you enjoy the comments and contributions from the panel and indeed the discussion that follows. Over to you, Ying. Thank you very much, Pip, for your uh, warm welcome and for giving us such a wonderful start uh, to the evening. Uh, my name is Ying Liu. Uh, very good evening to you if you are uh, in Melbourne, uh, like I am, uh, uh, or from Australia or from New Zealand. Uh, good morning or good afternoon if you're from other parts of the world. Uh, it is a great privilege to be able to host this event across time zones and to be able to welcome an audience from different countries. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, by way of introduction, please allow me to say a few things about the Asia Pacific Trust Law Series and about Volume 1. The idea of a project to discuss trust law across Asia Pacific first came up in a conversation three years ago uh, between myself, uh, my colleague Matthew Harding, and uh, Ying Chia Wu from Seoul National University. And in that conversation, we noted that there was an absence of an inclusive forum across the region to discuss trust law matters. Without such a forum, there was no opportunity for jurisdictions with different levels of experiences in trust law to engage in dialogue. It was also a missed opportunity to gain insights from the rich diversity of trust laws in the region. So the Asia Pacific Trust Law Project was established to fill that gap. The project aims to unearth themes in trust law and to address common challenges faced by Asian Pacific jurisdictions. It ultimately aims to encourage jurisdictions to develop trust laws in a coordinated way. Volume one, uh, Theory and Practice in Context, is based on the papers presented at the inaugural symposium, which we were thankfully able to host in person uh, at the Melbourne Law School in December 2019, shortly before the pandemic started. We thought it would be a good idea to discuss the modern issues faced by different jurisdictions in trust law in order to get a feel for the state of trust law in the region. The book discusses each of the top 17 jurisdictions in the region, ranked by GDP, the Pacific offshore jurisdictions, as well as the uh, private international law perspective. Speaking for myself, uh, working on this first volume was tr truly eye-opening. Uh, thanks to our brilliant contributors, I discovered for the first time how much Asia Pacific has to offer in terms of trusts, law, scholarship and practice. I hope you too will feel the same. Uh, but before I get carried away, I should stop talking anymore about the book and leave our distinguished speakers to say more about it. I have two more tasks in my introductory remarks. First, the order of proceedings for today. Each of our speakers will speak in turn, and then Matthew and I will join them in forming a panel for a Q&A session. Uh, Matthew will be facilitating the discussion uh, and you can send your questions via the chat function to us on Zoom at any time uh, during today's event. My second and most important task is to introduce you to our distinguished speakers. It is my delight and honor to introduce Justice Susan Glacebrook and Justice Andrew Pang. As judges of the apex courts in New Zealand and Singapore and influential figures in the development of the common law, they will no doubt be familiar to many of us here. Uh, let me start by saying a few words about Justice Glacebrook. Justice Susan Glacebrook is a judge of the Supreme Court of New Zealand. She was appointed to that position in August 2012. Previously, she was appointed to the High Court of New Zealand in 2000 and to the Court of Appeal in 2002. Justice Glacebrook chaired the Institute of Judicial Studies from 2007 to 2012. She is currently the president of the International Association of Women Judges. In 2014, 
Justice Grace Brooke was appointed a Dame Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services to the judiciary. Before her time at the bench, Justice Grace Brooke was a partner at the law firm Simpson Grierson. She has also served as a member of various commercial boards and government advisory committees. Justice Glacebrook holds a DPhil from the University of Oxford in French legal history. And now for a few words about uh, Justice Pang. Justice Andrew Pang is a Justice of the Court of Appeal of Singapore, a position he has held since February 2006. Since 2018, Justice Pang has also held the position of Vice President of the Court of Appeal. Previously, he was appointed Judicial Commissioner of the Supreme Court in January 2005 and was elevated to a judge shortly thereafter in December 2005 before his appointment as a Judge of Appeal. He is currently the Vice President of the Singapore Academy of Law. Uh, prior to his time at the bench, Justice Pang taught at the National University of Singapore Law Faculty from 1982 to 2000, before being appointed as Professor of Law at the Singapore Management University, and a year later, the Chair of the Department of Law at the University's Business School. In 2004, Justice Pang was one of the first two legal academics in Singapore to be conferred the title of Senior Counsel. Justice Pang holds a Doctor of Juridical Science from Harvard University. I should add that both justices have also been good friends to the Melbourne Law School. Uh, Justice Pang has participated in academic events at the law school previously, including the Misleading Silence Workshop in 2019. And Justice Glacebrook previously gave the 2018 Sir George Turner Lecture on Charities, Politics and Tax. We are grateful and delighted indeed to have them back again for today's event. And without further ado, I now hand you over to Justice Glacebrook, who will speak first, followed by Justice Pang. Uh, over to you, Justice Glacebrook. Thank you for that um, very kind um, introduction. It um, gives me a great deal of pressure to have been asked to speak at the launch of um, this first volume in the series of Trust Law and Practice in the Asia Pacific region. And can I start by congratulating the editors um, for uh, first, I think, coming up with the concept of a regional dialogue on trusts and more to the point, and having it come to fruition with this first volume. Uh, the aim is ambitious. It's not just to have a succession of papers on the law, but it aims to put trust law into its wider social, economic, and political context. So the overarching question that the book and the series will attempt to address is what trust law can, can contribute to social stability and economic prosperity. So you can see why I call it um, an ambitious project. This is um, particularly the case, I think, uh, because the Asia Pacific region must be one of the most diverse in the world in terms of its history, culture, religion, political systems, and legal traditions. This uh, provides its own obvious challenges in taking a regional approach. So even where concepts might appear similar, they have to be understood in their own cultural and legal context. This, however, can also mean a richness in a comparative approach that's lacking where the language and tradition of the law is common. So that diversity gives much more scope for mutual learning. What, what is interesting about most of the countries covered in the first two parts of the book, and that's my task um, to concentrate on those um, first two parts, is the fact of colonization, in particular by Britain, meaning that many of um, those um, countries share a common legal heritage, at least um, through colonial times. But these countries obviously also had their own legal traditions predating the arrival of English law and continuing today. Many of the papers in this first part of this first book track the interaction between customary constructs and English law, between traditional constructs and English law 
as well. This is a phenomenon that of course goes much wider than the law of trusts and is reflected in the decision in Aotearoa New Zealand to integrate concepts of um, tikanga, Māori customary law, throughout the law school uh, legal curriculum. So not just um, papers by themselves, but effectively integrated right um, through the curriculum. The, um, this reflects to a degree what's been happening uh, in uh, the uh, law generally, um, in terms of legislation, um, Māori customary law, the Treaty of Waitangi, and uh, various um, tikanga concepts or customary law concepts have long been um, incorporated into legislation in New Zealand, uh, starting also to have a major influence on the, on the common law. This um, creates its own issues, um, both in terms of the distortion of tikanga, concerns about that distortion of tikanga, and also how that can be integrated together. Uh, and I think this um, particular volume um, says quite a lot about some of those issues. And um, so arising out of the diversity of the region and the multiple legal traditions within each country itself are themes which run uh, through parts one and two of the book. So first of all, of trusts being used for different purposes in different jurisdictions, for example, in the Singapore chapter, it's argued that trusts have been used as an instrument of social policy, and especially in relation to the role of the family. In the chapter on Pakistan, it's argued that the constructive trust principle can be used to recognize women's contributions to a marriage and the family, both in accordance with my, what might be thought um, more modern thinking, but also the traditional uh, aspect of the family. In um, Bangladesh, it seems um, that the trust concept has been embraced with enthusiasm in a wide variety of contexts, um, from individual trusts to trusts in the um, commercial and banking sectors. And the chapter on the Philippines looks largely at the use of trusts in the commercial field. And another theme is um, legal pluralism, pluralism, as I was um, discussing before. And here, the chapter on Sri Lanka outlines how the law of trusts uh, has engrafted itself quite comfortably, it seems, on what was already a uh, rather mixed uh, legal tradition. But what we also have, um, and discussed also in this volume, is the tension between tradition and trust law, illustrated in the Hong Kong chapter by the struggle of colonial law, including trust law, to understand traditional concepts of land holding and the eventual adaptation of trust law principles in that regard. It's also um, illustrated in the chapter on India and particularly so, I think, and the inter interaction between um, customary law and um, trust law and the tensions this can cause, including the distortion of the nature of customary institutions. And I think there's a very timely warning in that chapter. What was inappropriate was to stress, and I quote, what was inappropriate was to stress the perceived analogy too far and to fail to respect the significant differences between the two sets of devices. This led to the use of foreign English principles and the resolution of disputes concerning native trust-like devices, and eventually to the distortion of the true character of those devices. No doubt though, while legal pluralism brings its dangers, a collaborative approach to across jurisdictional perspectives, properly informed by historical and cultural differences, I think stands to generate insights that may seed legal and policy solutions to social, economic, and even political challenges in multiple jurisdictions. And of course, this is um, one of the aims of um, the um, text. I thought um, um, unashamedly I'd um, return a bit more to um, the New Zealand um, position and just say a few words, uh, especially about the um, use of um, trusts in respect uh, and uh, the long term use of trusts in respect of uh, Maori 
uh, land holding traditions in particular. Now, generally speaking, um, trusts are possibly one of the closest manifestations in a Western legal sense to the notion of um, customary title. Um, effectively, there was no notion in um, traditional Māori society of land uh, belonging to anybody. People were custodians of the land, custodians uh, for their ancestors, um, custodians um, in particular for future generations. There was um, a symbiotic relationship very much between the land and the people. So no concept of ownership, effectively the concept of um, custodianship, of guardianship. Um, guardianship both for the land for its own sake, and I'm often imbued uh, with um, uh, ancestor-like qualities in terms of the land itself, and in particular um, issues in relation to um, rivers, et cetera, which has led in New Zealand for in some of the uh, Maori Treaty of Waitangi settlements to um, rivers um, and other uh, aspects of, of nature being given legal personhood. And that will be interesting to see how that um, in fact um, operates in practice. Um, at the moment, I think it um, has probably not seen its full potential in terms of what will, will happen with those um, new um, traditional um, and modern uh, views combined. So trusts have been um, certainly um, uh, very important in uh, the way that land has been held in New Zealand. It hasn't unfortunately stopped the alienation of most of the land um, over the, the course of the, uh, the, the century since colonization. Um, it also had its difficulties because uh, that idea of the, the split between the legal ownership of land and the beneficial ownership of land does not um, fit very comfortably in terms of uh, Māori traditional society and the traditional way that the, the Māori people relate to the land. It also created difficulties, obviously, in any type of um, decision making in respect of the land that is a collective culture. There's collective decision making and the trust concept did not lend itself particularly well to that. Modern day, there have been adaptations of that um, and there much more um, view of incorporating those tikanga principles of land ownership and how one um, operates land. Uh, to um, the, the more modern um, society. So it probably is one of the more suitable models um, among the existing legal frameworks of Māori governance, uh, but uh, in the present day, there's certainly a move uh, to look uh, more at incorporating um, true tikanga principles into um, business ventures and into uh, the way land is uh, administered and especially that guardianship aspect of the land and that um, common uh, view of um, collective responsibility. Now, um, moving on um, to uh, probably the uh, other aspect of um, the first part of uh, this um, incredible um, volume or the first two parts of this volume. Probably um, what might be seen as um, the remaining chapters are perhaps a more traditionally legal focused, although having said that, they're uh, focused in the, in the theory uh, rather than um, and the theory and the, um, the concept of the trust rather than uh, looking at it in, um, in a narrow legal sense. The, the Malaysian chapter I found particularly interesting because it was looking at the concept of constructive trust in respect of uh, large scale fraud and how that might operate in that circumstance. The Australian chapter uh, uh, resonated um, in particular with me. And again, you'll probably um, have to excuse me because I'm going to move into uh, discussing again the, the New Zealand situation. But just looking at the Australian chapter, it's looking very much at the rights to um, due administration of the trust. And due administration of the trust um, in the sense um, where uh, the beneficiary does not have a, an absolute entitlement um, to the benefit of trust property. 
in the past, that right to due administration um, really did hinge on the beneficiary um, having that entitlement, so that uh, it was effectively a proprietary entitlement and uh, reflected the need for there to be somewhere, someone in the position to compel the trustee to adhere to the trust terms um, and a right which is um, related to the trustee's performance of um, his or her duty. Um, to exercise the powers. Um, and of course, there are limitations in a proprietary role if there aren't what might be seen as um, proprietary um, beneficiaries who have an absolute right um, to the property itself. Um, so now um, the, the more modern approach is um, looking at it in terms of obligations, in terms of um, obligations that the trustee has and the right to due administration, and obviously that includes the right to information being done on uh, my I suppose I um, have to um, acknowledge the, the last chapter on um, that was looking at New Zealand um, and the, um, the plea of Professor Palmer um, for the courts um, to um, make sure that they don't distort um, trust principles. I suppose just a, a brief comment about the New Zealand position that New Zealand has a love affair with trusts. Um, they uh, also uh, have so much of a love affair with trusts that they effectively uh, have landed up uh, with situations where trusts are used um, in inappropriate situations and often in situations where the, the trustees do not understand uh, their duties. The beneficiaries are not really in a position um, to um, make sure that the um, trust is um, adhered to and in situations where they are probably used inappropriately uh, to um, avoid aspects of um, relationship property uh, settlements and also um, in terms of insolvency. Um, I suppose the criticism is well made um, that uh, the courts may have um, uh, reacted to those things by distorting trust principles to a degree. On the other hand, if trusts are used for totally inappropriate purposes um, and in situations where they, they were not meant to operate and are not operating properly, uh, one can understand why the, the courts might have felt um, uh, a need to move um, towards um, doing something about that. Uh, on the, um, uh, did you, I probably can't leave that other device without, uh, without making uh, difficulties here. Um, in any event, um, I think um, the legislation has never quite managed to um, get uh, the, the right balance there. Um, no doubt the courts haven't either. Um, and so I think that's probably um, enough said, apart from, again, to congratulate uh, the, um, the people who have um, written in relation to this book, who have spent so much time um, discussing it, and above all, to the editors. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Justice Glucebrook, for your, for your wonderful uh, speech and, and the very um, um, thrilled and happy that we, we, we managed to, to uh, hear the, the, the last part of the speech as well. So thank you very much for logging on to the, an alternative device. Uh, and, and now to hand the time over to Justice Pang uh, for his speech. Uh, over to you. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, Justice Glazebrook, Professor Nicholson, Professor Harding, Professor Liu, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to have been invited to say a few words on the launch of the present book, Asia Pacific Trust Law, Volume 1, Theory and Practice in Context which has been excellent, excellently edited by Professors Ying Kai Liu and Matthew Harding. I hesitated initially in accepting the invitation because judges are more often than not generalists in nature. I certainly am. Indeed, as I mentioned on another occasion, my last substantive account, encounter with equity and trust dates back more than four decades during my student days, with my principal textbook being the 10th edition of Henry and Maudsley Modern Equity, a full 11 editions prior to the latest edition, which is now known as Hanbury, Hanbury and Martin Modern Equity. I believe, uh, Matthew, it's going to be 12 editions soon, I think. So I therefore propose to interact briefly with the excellent essays in this book on a more general level. I will also comment more specifically, albeit also briefly, on the essays in parts three to five of the book, 
Justice Glazebrook of the Supreme Court of New Zealand has in fact al already dealt with parts one and two of this work in an excellent and perceptive speech. Now in a forward to a recent book, I observed as follows, and I quote, however, the common law never stands still. Indeed, the ability to, as well as the attainment of actual change is part of its genius. That an ostensibly cumbersome creature can suddenly turn sharply agile has always fascinated me. And even more so after leaving legal academia and joining the bench, watching and even harnessing as well as applying it in practical action, so to speak, has made me marvel at this unique quality all the more." Unquote. Now, indeed, these observations apply equally to equity, which was, of course, intended to supplement the common law. It has since developed into a complex as well as very useful body of legal principles in its own right. One of its more prominent doctrines centers on the heart of this book itself, the trust. A useful definition of a trust can be found in a local monograph on property and trust law in Singapore by professors Alvin C. Yip Man and Goyi Han as follows, and I quote, the trust has had a long history dating back to the 13th century. It was then known as the use and was a conveyancing device for the holding of land for financial and inheritance reasons. The person who transferred the land was known as the trustor, for he transferred his land in someone he trusted, known as the trustee, a trustee. The trustee held the land for a third party known as a beneficiary since that person benefited from the use of land. Now, despite its small its specific historical roots, the concept of the trust has been adapted to not only cover its original purposes, but also new and more modern contexts as well. This may be seen, for example, in the context of private banking and wealth management. This bears testimony not only to the internal coherence of the concept itself, but also its ability to be adapted to purposes beyond those that existed at its point of origin. Indeed, the longevity and potential viability, as well as scope of a concept, will determine its ultimate place in the body of legal learning as embodied in both judgments, as well as legal literature. Now, in this regard, I'm pleased to note that the very first trust textbook in Singapore, entitled Singapore Trust Law by Christopher Hare and Vincent Ui, has just been published. It is an excellent work, comprehensive in scope and clear as well as perceptive in its discourse and, and analysis with Singapore cases cited wherever possible. There's also the helpful citation of academic lit literature. The law of trust in Singapore has certainly come of age. Now, before we proceeding to say a few words on the second part of the present book, I might perhaps be permitted to make a few general observations. The comparative nature of this work is of the utmost benefit in at least two respects. At the most basic level, it is, it is always beneficial to learn about other legal systems. Such knowledge is not acquired merely for its own sake. With increase and increasing internationalization and globalization, a knowledge particularly of the general principles of key areas of the law of other jurisdictions is not only desirable, but also essential. To adopt any other approach is to bury our heads in legal sand. More importantly, on a practical level, a comparative understanding has the potential to enhance one's own law, a point which is emphasized by the editors right at the outset of the present book. In Singapore, for example, the courts draw together the best possible rules and principles from a myriad of jurisdictions in order to develop the law in a particular area in a manner that is logical, principled, as well as coherent. Whilst it is true that there have also been departures in the main from the English law that has hitherto been received in Singapore, such departures or divergences are not affected for their own sake, because that would be mere legal parochialism, which would be the antithesis of an outlook that should be consistent with the increase and increasing internationalization and globalization to which I have just referred. Indeed, on occasion, even departures are but temporary ones, now, an excellent illustration from the Singapore perspective may be found in the context of the imposition of a constructive trust in relation to the receipt of illicit bribes and secret commissions by a fiduciary. And particular reference may be made in this regard to the decision of the late Justice Lai Kyu Chai in Sumitomo Bank and Tahir Kartika Ratna, which declined to follow the then leading English Court of Appeal decision in Liston and Stubbs. Indeed, Sumitomo Bank was endorsed in the Hong Kong Privy Council decision of Attorney General for Hong Kong and Charles Warwick Reed. However, 
the English Court of Appeal in Sinclair Investments and Versailles Trade Finance affirmed the position in Lister and Stubbs, although the UK Supreme Court finally overruled both Lister and Stubbs and Sinclair Investments in FHR European Ventures and CEDA Capital Partners, as a result of which English law in this field has now and significantly become aligned with that in Singapore. The initial divergence has now resulted in convergence. Let me now turn to the present book proper. If I may be permitted to say so, it is an achievement of the first rank. The editors are to be congratulated on bringing together so many authors from so many diverse jurisdictions and for editing and compiling all your essays into one impressive volume. As the editors have pointed out, the different parts of the present book groups jurisdictions together based on perceived commonalities. In this regard, part three of this of the work examines the relevant law in East Asia, specifically Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and China. What is significant is that unlike the jurisdictions considered in part one of this book, the East Asian jurisdictions were never part of the British Empire. As the editors point out, and I quote, their respective civil codes were variously influenced by German, French, and Soviet legal traditions, unquote. Now, this raises an interesting and important question. To the extent that the law of trust is historically part of the English common law system, does the fact that these jurisdictions do not derive their respective legal systems from the English common law, and of course, the accompanying rules and principles of equity, affect the concept of the trust and trust law in relation to the same? At this juncture, it occurred to me that viewing the situation from the perspective of substance and not merely form, it is entirely possible that because the concepts of the trust and trust law perform certain practical functions that are necessary, regardless of the societal, culture, and mores concern, it will not be surprising in the least to find them embodied even in legal systems that have not received the English common law. Now, this initial intuitive sense was in fact confirmed by the excellent chapters in this part of the book. Put simply, each of these East Asian jurisdictions does indeed recognize and adopt the trust. Not surprisingly, however, as these jurisdictions were influenced by the civilian legal tradition, the recognition and adoption of the trust is to be found in statutes. Let me turn now to a few comments on the specific chapters themselves. Professor Tamara Tamaruya's chapter, entitled The Transformation of Japanese Trust Law and Practice, Historical Contexts and Future Challenges, notes at the outset that Japan is one of the earliest civil law jurisdictions that introduced the common law trust by statute. Indeed, the first legislation, the Trust Act, was enacted in 1922 and was replaced by the Trust Act of 2006. I found it extremely interesting that the Japanese law of trust was utilized for the most part for commercial purposes and has only relatively recently been utilized in relation to family trusts. This is quite different from the situation in, for example, England, where the reverse approach was adopted. Once again, two general points, in my view, emerge. The first, already alluded to earlier, testifies to the versatility of the trust. The second, which is closely related to the first, is the importance of social and cultural mores. The trust is no mere legal, abstract legal concept, but operates in a practical and functional context, which includes the needs of the society concerned. These two general principles or points emerge in other chapters as well. For example, the versatility of the trust is demonstrated once again in Professor Wu's chapter entitled Debtor Rehabilitation and the Asset Partitioning Effect of Security, Security Trusts the Korean Supreme Court's position revisited. Professor Wang's and Professor Yang's chapter entitled Taiwan's Trust Law and Name Borrowing Arrangements, and Professor Hui's chapter entitled The Legal Nature of the Chinese Charitable Trust. Professor Wu explores the relationship between South Korean trust law on the one hand and its bankruptcy law in general and rehabilitation orders in particular on the other, a controversial issue in South Korean law. Professor Wang and Professor Yang inform us that Taiwan's trust law was promulgated only in 1996, although the law of trust figures prominently in the context of name borrowing arrangements. Professor Hui characterizes the continuing development of the Chinese charitable trust as one that is a mixture of both 
public law and private law norms. I also found it interesting that Professor Wu, as well as Professor Wang and Professor Yang, were somewhat critical of the significant role played by the law of trusts, thus demonstrating to some extent at least the importance that local conditions and law play in relation to the role of trust in a particular jurisdiction. Now turning to part four of the book, as in part three, all the jurisdictions featured are civilian jurisdictions, Thailand, Indonesia, and Vietnam. However, as the editors point out, they deserve distinct and separate treatment because they are jurisdictions in which historically there have been minimal legislative efforts to incorporate trust law. Indeed, another as well as closely related common theme in this part of this book is the fact that the role of the trust itself is much more limited and circumscribed. For example, insofar as Thailand is concerned, Professor Suresha Riki and Professor Adam Riki in their chapter entitled The Surviving Legacy of English Trust Law in Thailand point at the outset to the fact that the general understanding of trust in Thailand is that they are, they are prohibited except where expressly permitted by statutes and consequently has never occupied a central position in the country's mainstream legal consciousness. However, the learned authors point to yet a third area where the English law of trust still has some, and I quote, lingering effects. This particular area relates to trusts that came into existence prior to the Civil and Commercial Code in 1935, and whose existence may be traced as far back as 1855. Such trusts were the result of the introduction of extraterritoriality. Nevertheless, the authors point out that whilst a, a legal transplant, the Supreme Court of Thailand uh, applied its own understanding as well as interpretation of English trust law and has created, together with Thai legal principles as well as past Thai cases, new principles applicable to Thai common law trust cases. In addition to being a fascinating study in comparative law as well as legal history, this chapter illustrates once again, not only the versatility of the trust, but also how local needs and conditions can impact the development of what was hitherto an English legal concept. In the Indonesian context, one finds once again the much more limited and circumscribed role of the trust. As Mr. Eddie Lex in his chapter entitled Arrangements Resembling Trust under Indonesian land law points out, the law of trust applied in the main to banking activity. Further, there are pursuant to the Indian Civil Code or ICC arrangements that are similar to trusts. Outside the code, trust-like arrangements are found in company law, social welfare law, foundation law, Wakaf law and capital market law, for example, real estate investments, trust and infrastructure investments, trust. As the title of this chapter itself suggests, the present chapter focuses on trust-like arrangements in the context of land transactions. I pause to note at this juncture that the trust in its original form does not apply in the Indonesian context. As the learned author puts it, a pure trust concept is not recognized under Indonesian law since that law does not recognize equity. However, it nevertheless still impacts the Indonesian legal system through arrangements that are similar to what we find under traditional trust law, albeit achieved via the ICC or Indonesian land law. Thus attesting once again to the versatility here of the concept of the trust and in which the practical function of the trust is achieved. The comparative value of this chapter ought also to be noted as I also learned much amongst other things about Indonesian land law in the process of reading this chapter. Similarly, there is no legislation in Vietnam providing for specifically providing for specifically for trust law as such. Mr. Nguyen Hong Kwang and Mr. Nguyen Te Zong make this important point at the outset of their chapter entitled Property Management Relationships and Trusts in Vietnam. As the title of this essay suggests, the authors focus on property management relationships. In particular, they conduct a thorough review of property management relationships arising in different contexts in Vietnamese law and compare these with the trust to ascertain their similarities and differences. Not unlike the chapter on Indonesian law, this chapter demonstrates once again the versatility of the concept of the trust 
even though there's no importation of trust law in its conventional form as is understood in equity. And as with the previous chapter, I also learned much about Vietnamese law in this particular context. I now turn to the final part, part five of the book. This comprises two chapters dealing with offshore trusts in the South Pacific and with private international law in the context of Asia Pacific trust law. As the editors pertinently point out, these chapters illustrate the role of trust in a global economic system that reaches well beyond economically significant jurisdictions while simultaneously reminding us that at least some of the challenges thrown up by trust law and practice in the region demand global attention and solutions. It is thus only fitting that these chapters which deal with the role of the trust in more wide ranging and global contexts bring to a close this excellent volume. Now in her chapter entitled Offshore Trust in the South Pacific, how far can the concept of the trust be stretched before it breaks? Professor Katie Barnett, poses the basic difficulty right at the outset, which bear quotation in full as follows, and I quote, offshore jurisdictions have taken the basic structure of a traditional trust and stretched it. While the offshore trust has a nominal trustee, in many offshore trusts, the true controller of the trust may be a third party protector or enforcer who directs the trustee by letter of wishes. Of wishes. The enforcer or protector may also be the set law and the settlor may retain such a degree of control over the assets as to render the trust a bare trust, effectively illusory or even a sham. Some offshore jurisdictions allow orphan structures or pure purpose trusts where there is no clear beneficiary. Others allow Red Cross trusts where there is a nominal residual beneficiary, usually a charity who is not really intended to receive the benefit of the trust. Lionel Smith has questioned whether these are really trusts at all. While, as Richard Garnett's chapter in this collection shows, private international law has typically allowed a hundred flowers to bloom in defining the notion of a, the trust, perhaps reflecting my common law prejudices, my chapter argues that there must be some coherent limit on those flowers which are covered by the definition of trust, and that some of these things called trust are so far stretched as to be illusory or shams. Now, this is a, an important point. We have already seen how versatile the trust, or at least the concept of the uh, trust is. However, Professor Barnett raises the very pertinent question as to where the line is to be drawn. For if trusts are used effective, as effectively shams, perhaps that is the point at which the law must state that useful as they are, they can no longer be legally recognized. Now put rather crudely, perhaps the ends can no longer justify the means. Now, whilst I understand that there's some debate, you know, and not everyone accepts, for example, Professor Smith's views. But whilst there might, may be some debate as to where precisely the line is to be drawn, the general principle expounded, I think, is a sound one. Now, the final chapter, entitled Identifying an Asia-Pacific Private International Law of Trust by Professor Richard Garnett, is a fascinating study of the relevant private international law or conflict of laws rules in relation to both the applicable law as well as the jurisdiction. Now, insofar as the former is concerned, Professor Garnett fo focuses on the articles of the 1985 Hague Trust Convention, which is largely consistent with the corresponding common law conflict of laws rules in the context of express trust. However, as constructive and resulting trusts fall outside the scope of the convention, these are governed by private international law rules at common law, and these are dealt with by the learned author who distinguishes between the Australian position on the one hand and that of the other Asia Pacific common law jurisdictions on the other. Now the remaining part of this chapter is devoted to the question of jurisdiction, where once again, the re relevant rules in Australia are quite different. More specifically, Professor Garnett focuses on the specific categories relating to trust with respect to foreign land, local land, as well as property other than land. Now to conclude, I found this book to be a fascinating one. It is not only informative, but also thought provoking. As already mentioned, it was a veritable Herculean effort on the part of the editors to gather so many authors from so many diverse jurisdictions. The result is a resource that is probably the first of its kind and which will not be not only fascinating to academic scholars, but will also guide legal practitioners as well. The editors and authors are to be warmly congratulated for all their efforts 
and can be confident that this book will be the first port of call for all who are involved in this important area of the law. Finally, may I take this opportunity to wish everyone continued good health and safety during these very difficult times. Thank you. Perhaps I can hand over this time to Professor Harding now. Uh, well, thank you very much, um, Justice Glazebrook and Justice Pung for those reflections uh, on the book uh, and the, the kind words as well. Um, Justice Glazebrook, we're very grateful to you in particular for your fortitude as the technology um, ebbed and flowed. And I suspect um, you were in extempore mode there towards the end and um, very grateful for you. Um, Justice Pung, uh, the um, uh, very insightful remarks that you made um, belie the, the claim that you uh, put out there early on that um, your last substantive engagement with um, trust law was 40 years ago. I can't believe that that's the case. <laughs> um, the common law and equity um, it might be an English inheritance, um, but these days I think um, there's pretty strong argument um, that it takes on its most interesting and dynamic and vibrant character in the Asia Pacific. Um, and this in no small part is thanks to the outstanding jurists of our region. And we're very grateful to have just heard from two of them. So thank you to you both. Um, now, I think we are able to constitute a panel at this point of Justice Glazebrook, Justice Pung, and Professor Liu. Are we able to have everyone visible on the screen uh, at the one time so that um, we can um, take question and answer. Um, I might just press on um, with, with some questions. If, if Does that sound okay to everybody? Um, but we do have a little time for questions. And um, uh, as um, Catherine has said, you can use the Q&A function um, to um, pose your questions. Um, and uh, there are a couple already in there, which um, we begin with. Um, the, the first question, um, uh, I suppose, uh, goes to the, the future of this project. And so I might invite Ying to say something in response to it first. And then, of course, Justice Glazebrook and Justice Pung, feel free to also offer any reflections. The question is this. Um, following the publication of this book, what lines of inquiry for future research into comparative trusts law might be particularly fruitful? And the question isn't confined to the Asia Pacific region, but um, uh, it, it might be good to start there and then if there are broader reflections to, to offer those as well. So uh, Ying, would you like to um, say something in response to begin with? Yes, definitely. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you for this uh, wonderful question. Um, what I can speak to is, um, in particular, in relation to Volume 2, because that is actually coming up. We're having uh, our symposium this December, hopefully a publication uh, of that book next year. Um, one of the themes that came up in our inaugural symposium was that different jurisdictions across the region had um, used trust law to, to meet certain needs. Uh, for example, social, religious, economic, commercial, historical uh, needs in the past and sort of ways in which the trust law has been used to, to adapt and, and resolve some of these um, issues in jurisdictions. Uh, but also one of the interesting things was that those uh, needs were actually common uh, shared needs across jurisdictions. They weren't isolated incidents Incidences, but actually shared across uh, different jurisdictions. So the um, the, the 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 next volume is, is actually um, designed to uh, unearth some of these uh, uh, needs and how trust law has been adapted to 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 them. Uh, so so that there is some sort of um, interaction in terms of how the law can be used uh, to uh, improve. Uh, the situation in, in uh, uh, the needs across the jurisdictions in the, in the region, um, but that is that is only for the next volume. And and the, and uh, uh, Justice Pang or Justice Glazebrook might have uh, reflections on that as well that we can take on board. Definitely, probably the only thing I'd say it sounds um, wonderful. I can't wait to to read it. 
Yes, um, yeah, what fascinated me, I think, you know, uh, as I mentioned in, in my speech, this idea of form and substance and universal in particular, this, you know, all this sounds very theoretical, but actually when you drill down to the practical aspects, um, regardless of jurisdictions, there's always this idea of a, a function that has to be performed. And perhaps if you better, you call it a trust or you call it something else, you know, um, it doesn't, it, it may not really matter because in effect, the substance is the same. Um, but I did notice that um, in jurisdictions that did not receive um, a common law and equity, um, the approach is, seems to be much, much more, more, how would one put it, much more conservative and it's on a need basis. And you find that, and therefore in many of the chapters, you find that the concept of the trust is really applied to um, just specific and difficult issues and problems. So I look forward to, to the next, because I think the next volume really is, is the logical kind of, it's a, it's, it's a logical progression where, where you, you start looking at, 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 at the trust as it, as it applies, you know, uh, both in theory as well as in practice. Yeah. Thank you all. Um, another question, um, and again, perhaps we can start with being, uh, and invite reflections from our two um, uh, judicial friends. Um, were there any features of trust law uh, in any jurisdiction covered in this book that surprised you or that challenged your own understanding of trusts? Uh, yes, so it was interesting to see, um, you know, coming from a common law tradition, speaking uh, for myself, uh, and, and, I, and I guess for all of us here on the panel as well, uh, trust law is, as a starting point, a case law based set of rules. Um, but when we look across the region, um, particularly it, uh, into those jurisdictions, uh, you know, civil law traditions where trust law is imported in statutes, uh, we see that certain choices have to be made, uh, don't we? Uh, the trust has to be, um, I wouldn't say reduced, but, but certainly put into words or put into concepts and, and choices have to be made when that, when that is done. Uh, and then the, the, you know, the jurisdiction is then left to grapple with the effects of those choices that have been made. So for example, um, which, you know, what sorts of effects of the trust should we put into a legal system? Which should we leave out? Uh, what sort of conception of the trust should we uh, should we use? Uh, and, and there are choices, uh, and, and there is not always a clear answer. So I think those uh, sorts of uh, choices, particularly in the uh, jurisdictions with civil law traditions, th those really fascinated uh, me personally. Uh, just to see, you know, the, the sort of on the one hand solutions that they could. Um, they could they could propose, but also the difficulties with those choices, and 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 and, and from there from there the sort of you know uh, future development, future potential of developing the law in in, in those contexts. Thanks, you, uh, Justice Glazebrook or Justice Pang. Is there anything you'd like to add on that? Um, what stood out for you is especially surprising in this collection, um, based on the understanding of trust. Um, I guess we, we, we learned from uh, uh, English common law equity heritage. I suppose the, the, the striking thing for me, um, just in terms of thinking about it, in terms of um, the um, customary law, uh, English law, um, colonialism context was, and, and this shouldn't have been surprising, of course, but just uh, what, what was surprising was um, the similar themes that were coming through effectively um, in a number of those jurisdictions with that um, customary law, um, English law tradition um, issue and um, distortion both ways in terms of um, the, the, the institutions and um, trying to adapt them to the particular customary institutions and traditional institutions. As I say, that shouldn't have surprised me because we have a common uh, tradition of colonialism. Uh, and I suppose on the other hand, uh, the enthusiasm with which um, trusts have been um, accepted in other jurisdictions and adapted to um, all sorts of circumstances where perhaps they uh, 
they might traditionally be thought to um, fit less easily. And um, so I, I think it was that that dual aspect to it that was probably, uh, it probably was surprising, but shouldn't have been. Thanks. I had, yeah, I had a similar view to Susan's because I knew that the trust was versatile, but it was more of, how, how would I put it, more of an intra, in, from a more kind of um, a, a, a common law, a common lawyer's viewpoint that the trust was versatile. It could be adapted, you know, from more ancient uses, you know, her, for inheritances to more modern contexts. But what really surprised me, maybe surprise is not the right word, but maybe fascinated me was the fact that um, the trust, the vers versatility of the trust went far beyond that. I mean, it went from from intra to inter, it went through to, to civilian jurisdictions as well, where they, they used the concept for specific to address specific problems. I think that was really um, an eye opener for me. And I think mm -hmm. that's, but that's really superb because I think really comparative law is very, very important. And, you know, both of you have done a signal service by bringing everyone together because it's so difficult to do. I mean, if you had asked me if I were in your shoes, I would have said impossible, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Um, I've tried, but I don't think it can be done, but you did it, you did it. And, and, the, and the chapters and, you, you know, uh, uh, I mean, the book is very, very important, but it is a starting point. So I'm glad you're having a volume two and maybe a volume three or four or five. <laughs> yeah. Yes, no pressure, Ying. Um, I, I might offer a reflection of my own in response to that question. Um, something that really stood out for me as we worked through these chapters and got to know um, their content was that um, if we're trying to ask the question, well, what, what are the normative underpinnings of trusts? Um, it seems like that's a pretty good question to ask. And uh, I say that because there's a, there's a sort of um, strand in, in trusts scholarship that says, well, there's no grand normative vision here underpinning this legal facility. It's all technical law. There's nothing to see here. Um, it's not like contract, which might have this close relationship with the moral practice of promising. It's not like the law of torts, which has a close relationship with moral duties that we owe to each other. It's just pure facilitative law. Um, but I'm not sure that that line of argument can work really, when you start to see that the same desire to facilitate a sort of other regarding stewardship of assets um, ends up finding expression in the legal systems of all these jurisdictions, irrespective of their heritage, their traditions, um, and uh, in some cases in conversation with the English, um, um, but also in other cases, in spite of it. And um, so I think uh, that for me says that um, to be asking questions about the normative underpinnings of trusts and whether they track um, a moral sense that we have about stewardship of assets or something like that is the right path to be on. Um, so that was really something that stood out for me, but then it would stand out for me because that's the sort of thing that I do in my own work. So um, now um, moving on to the next question, if I can. Um, and this is from Elise Band. Hi, Elise. Um, so Elise writes, across the chapters, um, have conceptions of trusts tended to adopt the obligational or the proprietary model? Or in uh, she writes, this can, of course, have significant consequences in insolvencies, but also, as Justice Glazebrook has noted, potentially in these settlement texts areas. Um, Elise goes on to write, it's also possible that trusts may be more readily transplanted to non-common law traditions on an obligational analysis, echoing Justice Park regarding legal traditions that have also embraced trusts. Um, Ying, what did you observe across the different chapters? Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Elise, for that question. I think that's a really interesting question because um, there is a, if you like, a more formal answer and a more substantive answer. And the formal answer is that the obligational model is the one that is adopted by jurisdictions where 
the validity and functioning of trust law depends on the statute. So for example, we learned, uh, didn't we Matthew, uh, in, in part two, when we looked at India and how the Indian Trust Act influenced, uh, you know, for example, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and also when it went across to Japan and then the rest of East Asia, that um, a choice was made um, to adopt the obligational model of the uh, 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 in, in the in that statute, and that has sort of um, uh, been exported to the other jurisdictions. Uh, however, when we look at it a little bit more closely, I think, uh, and this is the more substantive answer, which is that it, it is not a purely obligational uh, model, is it? it? It has the trust has many of the proprietary characteristics that we are used to in common law jurisdictions, um, and that sort of reminds me that even in the common law uh, tradition, the debates that go on between obligational versus proprietary theories, that um, there seems to be a sense that we, we're not really asking which one is it exclusively, but really which one is it predominantly. So, so the, it's not a, an either or question, it's a more of a, you know, which one uh, is it more like? So I, I think in that sense, there is some affinity across the uh, jurisdictions, although, it, you know, formally speaking, the answer, I think it's just, it's an obligational trust uh, in, in the civilian jurisdictions. I, I do wonder, I do wonder if any, any of us uh, here had, had sort of sensed that sort of uh, uh, duality, if, if I could put it that way, in, in these jurisdictions. Um, thanks. Um, Justice Glazebrook or Justice Pung, would you like to offer any thoughts on that? I'm going to say, plead, plead my lack of my lack of expertise. Yeah, because but but I mean, quite seriously, that it is a problem. I mean, uh, for for at least for example, I mean, you're an expert in unjust enrichment as well, and you 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 see pretty much the same you know difficulties and and the courts. I mean, the courts here, you know. Um, also, and there's so much academic writing and so on. So it's um, but I think Ying is right. But unfortunately, if a court were faced with this problem, it'd be quite difficult for a court to say, you know, it it could be, you know, usually you need to 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 come down one side or the other, you know. But I think I think from a theoretical perspective, I think there's much truth in what Ying says that it's it's not really binary, you know. Often it's complementary, and it's a question really of of of, of the degree of you know, of uh, predominance. So I'm, but but really this is quite outside my my area. Yes, well, certainly I can't um, really say terribly much about the um, civil law tradition. I have enough trouble with the the common law tradition, but. Um, uh, in, in the case I was talking about, ASEC, we probably didn't um, totally ditch a proprietary model because there was some, um, some feeling that you had to have that balance, um, especially in looking at your administration of the trust between an obligation model um, and um, stopping what might be sort of opportunistic and um, really busybody applications in respect of due administration because uh, so really limiting it to um, the um, the more detailed trust information going to those people who had a realistic chance of um, some benefit coming from the trust. I suppose if you're looking at it in a uh, just looking at it in sense of the the, the Māori trusts or the trusts that are in those um, those more collective um, views um, obligations would be uh, very much uh, the the idea because it, it's obligations and duties that are the the cornerstone of that um, customary model of collective right. So um, uh, yes, to a degree, a, a hybrid, but we're um, both in the common law tradition in New Zealand and um, just looking at it in terms of that customary law, um, very much more um, towards obligations and duties. Thanks very much. Um, a question now about um, about um, how judges in the region might respond to the um, diverse approaches to to trusts in the different jurisdictions. Um, given that there is such a diversity and a richness uh, there, to what extent should judges in one jurisdiction be looking 
to the jurisprudence in other jurisdictions uh, to draw upon in making decisions, uh, including um, for common law judges, civilian jurisdictions. Um, I might invite Justice Glazebrook, Justice Pung to offer some thoughts on, on that question. And Ying, of course, if you would like to as well. Well, I suppose New Zealand being a, a small jurisdiction, uh, we have always looked um, to overseas um, jurisprudence um, when we're, um, and especially probably in the more traditional legal senses where you, um, you, you might have legislation, but it's legislation that effectively is codified to a degree the common law and, and not totally either because there's still an awful lot of common law involved um, even when you do have statutes in, a, in, in this area in New Zealand uh, anyway. I think... Um, we probably have uh, been very reliant in the past on the English, um, and in fact, in some of the earlier decisions, you would think there was just one common law, and it was the common law of England, so we would um, cite cases um, as if they were New Zealand cases, and as if they were directly binding, even when they weren't um, directly binding. Um, so... Uh, I think we've moved away from that, and we've got more diverse in the um, in the in the case law that we look at. Uh, and uh, um, however, we still do tend to look more to case law from uh, what we would see as uh, comparable jurisdictions. And I think um, that that probably means that we haven't had that richness of of thought. Uh, that we could have had if we'd looked um, more widely. Now, now, of course, there's much more that's available, much more that's available um, in English right across those jurisdictions. But even so, uh, they're probably not often cited to us and we probably don't have that uh, tradition of looking. And I think um, possibly, especially with something like trust law, that's so, um, so based on the English um, common law equity um, tradition, uh, we haven't even thought of looking outside and a, a book like this I think probably does encourage that a, a lot more than, um, the, than will have been the case in the past and probably makes those comparisons more accessible. Um, I, as I, I think I alluded to in my speech, right, I, we, Singapore again like New Zealand is a small jurisdiction. Um, our, our basic approach in terms of common law, development of common law and equity is really to, to especially in controversial areas um, of the law or developing areas of the law, is to look at every, every possible major common law jurisdiction. I'm afraid we don't really look at civilian law because it's not directly applicable. Um, for example, in recently, um, for the penalty rule, um, we, we, looked, we looked at Australia, New Zealand, England, Hong Kong, Malaysia, you know, but we ended up actually just endorsing the old English approach in Dunlop. And we seem to be an outlier in that sense, but it was only, we only decided that after, after looking at, at all the cases and for all the judges and on, on the quorum to, to, to carefully consider the principles, the general principles that would be suitable for Singapore law. And, um, and in the end, um, we decided that you know it, that the the present law which we re received from England was was correct. So it uh, was it was not um, well. We didn't accept that you, you didn't need a breach. So we didn't follow Australia and Andrews. Um, we for the legitimate interest point, which was in uh, Mardesi, we, we 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 looked at the law and we we we've, we came to the conclusion that. Um, it was not necessary to adopt a legitimate interest approach. But the point really is, I only cite this because, and I could cite you a, a whole num number of, of cases where we, we look to every, every common law, relevant common law jurisdiction. And I think that's, that's wise because you're looking at general principles and you want to, you, it's almost like you want the best, you want to draw the best from what, what you have, you know, uh, available to you worldwide across the Commonwealth, for example, and, and I think that's that's basically the way the way the Singapore courts presently approach, you know, developing development of the law, especially in controversial and developing areas. 
thank you um, very much. For, uh, for myself, for myself, um, I hesitate very much to say anything uh, in the presence of Justice Glaceberg and Justice Pang about how um, judges in, in, in common law jurisdictions ought to treat um, uh, you know, uh, judgments in, in other jurisdictions. But I do op uh, offer one suggestion, uh, one observation, not a suggestion, but an observation, um, which, is, which is something that struck me when, when we were looking at uh, Asian civil law jurisdictions, which is that it's very often uh, in discussing their trust laws, uh, they, they tend always to use the common law jurisdictions in you know, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, England as a comparison. Uh, in developing their laws. And I think that that observation is, is very interesting in the sense that, um, uh, yes, while it is true that civil law judgments are, 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 are not very much considered in developing the common law for obvious reasons, um, the development of common law uh, is being considered by civilian uh, jurisdictions. And I think that itself just shows you how um, organic the jurisdictions are in the in the region and how even the development of common law can potentially have a very significant effect on the development uh, uh, in, of trust law in particular in uh, civil law jurisdictions. Thanks, Ying. Um, we might take one more question uh, before we um, bring the proceedings to a close. And this one might be for you, Ying, I, I, I won't um, uh, unless um, Justice Pung and Justice Glazebrook want to make some remarks about um, Australian law, um, uh, we, can, uh, we can handle this one between you and me, Ying. Um, are there any areas in which the trust law of Australia could improve based on what you've seen um, presented in this election? Are there lessons here for Australian trust law? Well, that's a hard one, isn't it? <laughs> Um, if I may just, you know, extend the, the, the usefulness of my, of my last answer, uh, j just to say that, uh, you know, Aust Australian, uh, the development of Australian law can very much bear in mind uh, the fact that the region uh, in developing other jurisdictions trust law, uh, they are looking at what, what we do here. And, um, and, and, and that sort of realization, I think, is you know directly or indirectly important especially when we when we try and sort of uh, think about novel ways in which the law might develop uh, but certainly there, there is also i guess more more specific um uh, it, it, certainly more specific answers that can be found in, in in jessica hudson's chapter on australian law in the in the volume uh, which uh, you know suggests uh, change or, or, or sort of a, a new way of looking at, at things in Australian trust law. So what about yourself, Matthew? Did you have any? Well, well, I think the question is a good reminder that we should always question our assumptions when we're thinking about law um, and, and that we shouldn't assume that just because Australian trust law handles a question a particular way, that this is the only way conceptually it could be handled or that it's the only way in which um, trust law could be normatively justified. Um, uh, it's always good to understand that elsewhere, different answers are given to the same questions. And so, yes, we might not recognise non-charitable purpose trust here, but um, uh, well, here are jurisdictions where they seem to have no problem with that. And so, um, what what can we learn from looking across and seeing that? And I'm sure that that same process of thinking could be applied in so many different areas of doctrine. So it's a great question, I think. So thank you for it. Um, okay, well, um, I think we're at the point now where it just remains for me to um, uh, offer some thanks. And can I start by once again thanking uh, Justice Susan Glazebrook and Justice Andrew Pung for their time and their insights uh, this evening. It's very generous of you both given how epically busy you both are. And Ying and I are very grateful, um, and I'm sure all of the participants this evening are grateful to you. So thank you um, for taking part in this launch. Um, can I also thank uh, the um, hosts of the launch, that's the Asian Law Centre and the Obligations Group at the Melbourne Law School, 
and also the Centre for Commercial Law in Asia at Singapore Management University, um, your support and helping with the logistics of this event is very um, greatly appreciated. Um, thanks to the Melbourne Law School Dean, Pip Nicholson, um, for joining us this evening to open the proceedings. Um, thanks to all of you for coming along uh, and um, uh, being part of this and also um, for those of you who asked your questions, um, thank you for those. Um, can, can Ying and I extend a very um, sincere thanks to the colleagues from around the region who um, wrote the chapters of this book and really filled it with rich insights um, and avenues of inquiry. It was really exciting to work with you all and we're so grateful for your efforts. Um, we want to say thanks to the discussants who um, really um, kept the conversation a lively one. 2019, when we had the conference that led to the book. Um, we want to say thanks to our research assistant, Ken Kiat, and the Melbourne Law School's Academic Research Service. Um, their meticulous work was absolutely fundamental to getting this book ready for publication. And of course, thanks to Hart Publishing for publishing this book and for their commitment to the series. And can I end with a very special thanks to the moving spirit behind this book and the Asia Pacific Trust Law series, uh, my colleague Ying Kai Lu. Uh, Ying, it's been a real pleasure to work with you on this project. Um, your leadership is what conceived it, kept it on track, and has now brought it to fruition. So I hope in all of this, you take a moment this evening to reflect on your achievement and take some pride in it. So thank you, everybody, and good evening.